السلام علیکم شروع میں میں تھوڑا اردو میں آپ سب کو ویلکم کر دیتی ہوں اور پھر اس کے بعد ویل ہیو ٹو شفٹ ٹو انگلش کیونکہ یہ آکسفرڈ یونیورسٹی کی ہسٹری آف سائنس میوزیم کا ایک سیشن ہے تو اوبیسلی دے وونٹ بی ایبل ٹو انڈرسٹینڈ اردو تو ہمیں پھر انگلش میں کرنا پڑے گا ایوری تھنگ سو سب سے پہلے تو بہت شکریہ آپ سب کا اینڈ وی ہوپ کہ آپ نے پچھلا سیشن بھی اٹینڈ کیا ہو جو جاب اکانو کا تھا ہیڈ آف دا میڈیا لیب آف سرن جو آئی بلیو از ون آف دا موسٹ انٹریکٹیو اینڈ جیم پیکڈ سیشنس آف ہمارا پورا آڈیٹوریم کا ایجنڈا تو دا اپ کمنگ سیشن از بائی کرس پارکن اینڈ ہیلن پول دس ہیلن پولی دس سیشن دے دیر بوتھ لرننگ پروڈیوسرس ایٹ دا ہسٹری آف سائنس میوزیم ایٹ دا یونیورسٹی آف آکسفرڈ they are going to be talking about how early in, uh, scientific instruments have been created had been created by muslims and what have been the contributions of muslim scientists in islam in, devel- uh, in developing science in developing technology and how these instruments such as astrolabes which we call astarab in urdu or qibla detectors or celestial globes have evolved through the time and how they still continue to play such a significant role in the development of technology and in the understanding of science and culture that we have currently. So thank you, Chris, and thank you, Helen, for joining us today. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody, and thank you to our hosts for inviting us to take part in such an exciting event. Uh, it's a great pleasure for us to be here with you today. Uh, my colleague, Helen, and I, Uh, are from the History of Science Museum at the University of Oxford. Uh, this museum is one of six collections that make up the gardens, libraries and museums, which is a division of the university. Uh, and they include the Ashmolean Museum of Artworks, the Pitt Rivers Museum of Ethnography, the Museum of Natural History, the Botanic Garden and uh, the Bodleian Libraries, one of the oldest university libraries in the country. The History of Science Museum is housed in a historic 17th century building. Uh, it's over 300 years old in the center of Oxford, which was originally built to house what is believed to have been the first public museum in the world, the original Ashmolean Museum. It now houses a, a rather extraordinary collection of historic scientific and mathematical instruments, uh, which is very diverse covering early mathematical and astronomical instruments, timekeeping instruments, globes and orreries, um, a small medical collection, uh, and a collection uh, which tells a story about the invention of early radio communication. And in amongst these, we also have an extraordinarily rare and unusual collection of early scientific and mathematical instruments from the Islamic world. But it is not just the collections that make the museum what it is today, uh, but the visitors, the communities, uh, the shared conversations, stories, and the exchange of experiences across all cultures that bring to life the meaning of a collection that represents the material culture of science. Indeed, the mission of the museum is to provide a meeting point for people, science, art, and belief. And that's why we're particularly glad to be here sharing this conversation with you today. Probably the most famous object on display in the museum is not a scientific instrument at all, but a humble blackboard. Here it is. And I wonder if anyone would like to guess who wrote on this board. Perhaps a question for younger members of our audience. I'll give you three options all of them uniquely brilliant mathematicians. Could it be Isaac Newton? Could it be Albert Einstein? Or could it be Muhammad Al-Khwarizmi? Hands up for A. Hands up for B, Einstein. Can't see many hands there. Uh, hands up for C, Quarizmi. Oh, that's interesting. That's really interesting. Uh, if he'd lived in another time, it might well have been his writing on this board. Uh, in fact, this is Albert Einstein's writing. Uh, Albert Einstein visited Oxford in 1931 to give a series of lectures explaining his general theory of relativity. And one of these lectures was about cosmology, about the universe. And this blackboard is a record of that lecture. 
In fact, the last three lines give his calculations of the density, the size, and the age of the universe in what was probably one of the earliest public uh, descriptions of the Big Bang Theory. Why is this exhibit so fascinating to people? Why do so many people come to see it? Yes, of course, Einstein is a very famous scientist, but I think there's more to it than that. It taps into an almost universal fascination with the origins of the universe, our place in it, the mystery it evokes, and the very human instinct for knowledge. And it touches also on the continually unfolding story that, that is perhaps the oldest science, astronomy. And this brings me to those early centuries of the Islamic world in which scholars made such an enormous contribution to this story as evidenced by some of the scientific instruments that we will share with you today. I'm sure many of you know much about the Islamic world uh, and how it spread in its early centuries. It spread rapidly from regions such as modern day Iraq, Syria and Egypt, eastward towards the Indian subcontinent uh, and westwards across the Maghrib region of North Africa and into Europe via Spain. And it's well known that the religion and culture of Islam encouraged the pursuit of knowledge, especially the practical sciences of mathematics, astronomy, geography, and medicine for the benefit of humanity. Scholars provided translations and commentaries on philosophical works inherited from the ancient Greeks in particular, and built on this knowledge through an astonishing network of scholarly communities in cities that were furnished with libraries, schools, and observatories. And so this brings us to uh, the museum's collection and probably the most accessible of the scientific instruments from the early Islamic world is the celestial or star globe. Celestial globes locate stars and constellations on the apparent sphere that makes up the sky. Here we have two, both Persian in origin, and fine examples of the craft of metalwork. And this type of instrument represents the earliest type of any globe, in fact, long before terrestrial or earth globes were invented. Why? Because it was possible for anyone anywhere to observe the stars in the heaven above and to notice that their relative positions, for the most part, remained constant. In these instruments, a truly universal science is born. This particular instrument we refer to as the Jafar globe after the name of its maker in the year 764 AH or 1362 AD. It consists of two brass hemispheres that have been soldered together. The stars are represented by inlaid silver discs whose sizes correspond to the magnitude of the stars. The axis of the globe can be adjusted for different latitudes in the northern hemisphere. The constellations were derived largely from the ancient Greek mythology, and the maker would have referred to the work of great astronomers such as Abd al-Rahman al-Sufi, whose treatise, uh, The Book of Fixed Stars, describes how to design the constellation images on the globe. I wonder if you can spot individual stars. Maybe you can spot a constellation in the form of a serpent. Or perhaps can you spot the constellation of Butes, the herdsman? Here is the serpent. And here is Butes, the herdsman. And here is another celestial globe, this time made in Lahore in 1663 by Daya al-Din Muhammad, a member of a family workshop which specialized in scientific instruments. On this example made of brass, the stars again have been inlaid in silver. But what is particularly remarkable in this case is its method of production. Most globes are made from two hemispheres which are joined together, whereas the Lahore family specialized in a very demanding process of casting complete hollow spheres 
using uh, something called the lost wax method. And this required a very sophisticated knowledge of metallurgy to create the alloys with the necessary properties for molten casting. That molten metal had to flow in the right way in order to make that hollow casting. Here we can see a close up of the inlaid stars and the constellation of the Great Bear. So how were the stars measured and recorded to make an accurate record? And what sort of mathematical knowledge was required for this? Well, here you can see a system of spherical coordinates uh, that could be used to measure and record the precise position of stars using such instruments as the quadrant for angular measurement of the altitude of a star above the horizon. In fact, the little figure in the top right hand corner of this slide gives us an idea of how these measurements were made. Here are a couple of examples of how stars might be plotted using angular measurements. See if you can visualize where these stars would be positioned around the spherical grid. Star one, 15 degrees around the equator and 20 degrees north, would put it, sorry, there. And star two, 60 degrees around the equator and 40 degrees north would place it there. So let us now progress to another instrument, even more mathematically sophisticated, that was to become almost emblematic of the great achievements in astronomy in the early centuries of Islam. First, we must appreciate that in keeping with the model inherited from the ancient Greeks, Muslim astronomers, not without question, assumed a geocentric model of the universe. That is, the earth is considered to be stationary at the center of the universe and all other celestial bodies, the sun, the moon and the stars were thought to revolve in concentric circles around about the earth. This indeed made a lot of sense and for the most part, the model resulted in an astonishing range of accurate predict predictions. A three dimensional representation of this model took the form of an instrument known as the armillary sphere. They were composed of a set of rings making up the skeleton of a sphere, which rotated around about the earth at its center. Here is a manuscript illustration of a 16th century version of an instrument from the Ottoman period. We have no early Islamic instruments of this type, but it is worth looking a little more closely at this instrument to understand the origin of another instrument derived from it. In this Italian instrument made in the 16th century, we can see the celestial sphere mounted at an angle for the latitude of Oxford. And if you look closely, you might be able to see some little curly star pointers mounted on the skeletal rings. We can also see the pathway of the sun marked out by the diagonal band that carries the constellations of the zodiac through which the sun passes on its annual journey. And here is the axis of rotation uh, of the uh, celestial sphere. And here is the line that represents the latitude uh, for which the instrument has been set up along with the observable horizon from that point on the earth. Now, hang on tight here as things are going to get a little bit more complicated and will require some spatial imagination. Imagine a set of coordinates, a bit like the ones that we were just plotting the stars on a moment ago, centered around the green dotted line above our position on the earth at the latitude of Oxford. And now imagine tilting the celestial axis of rotation, that's the red dotted line, to the horizon, the, the horizontal, like this. These pictures are of a model constructed by our very able technician for an exhibition. On the left, we can see the coordinate system for the sky above us at that latitude. And on the right, we can see the armillary sphere with its star pointers lying on its side. You can also see the diagonal band 
that is the ecliptic that describes the sun's movement through the heavens. Now imagine projecting a light through these structures onto a translucent plane. This process of projecting this structure uh, through the axis of rotation onto a plane is known by math mathematicians as a stereographic projection. And here is the result. An entirely new instrument can be realized by the combination of these projections that captures the two-dimensional representation of the cosmos with all the information about the movement of the sun and the stars and their positions, all of it connected by one thing, the passing of time. Known as the astrolabe, a kind of cosmic calculator that mirrors the apparent movement of the stars above us, here we have an instrument that was celebrated and developed to a high level of sophistication throughout the Islamic world. This knowledge has passed on to European scholars through treatises written in Arabic and translated into Latin. This example comes from North Africa and is made by Muhammad ibn Ahmed al-Batuti in about 1733. You can see clearly here the star pointers which are mounted discreetly on a dial known as the Riti, which rotates above a plate which carries that mathematical coordinate system. On the right is a separate image of the Riti showing its extraordinary delicacy. One complete rotation of this dial represents the passing of a day. With such a precise instrument that could be used to measure the time, day or night, from the stars or the sun, there was another very practical reason for developing this instrument in the Islamic world. This particular instrument was owned by a mosque in Fez, and it included curved lines engraved on the front plate, the meter, from which the five times of daily prayer could be precisely calculated. There are many fine examples of this instrument in the museum's collection, and in the time available, I can but share a few. This instrument is one of the finest examples in the museum's collection, and is testament to the extraordinary craftsmanship and excellence in metalwork that was practiced by makers across the Islamic world. It is a Persian instrument made in about 1647 by Muhammad Mukim al-Yazdi for the Safavid ruler, Shah Abbas II. It's about 15 inches in diameter, and it is impressive in its size as well as its decorative qualities. Inscribed on the throne or the kursi, that triangular part at the top of the instrument, is a dedication that reads, the Supreme Prince, the Sultan, the Most Just, the Most Great, Lord of the Centers of Command, remover of the causes of tyranny and rebellion, king of the kings of the age. A very grand statement indeed. Such an instrument expressed knowledge that rulers would wish to associate with power and possession. Here, uh, we can see the extraordinary delicacy of the Riti that carries the star pointers uh, and also incorporates in calligraphic tracery the name of its owner. And here we have another instrument associated with a powerful ruler, this time the nephew of the famous ruler Saladin, who reigned in Mesopotamia. The maker, Abd al-Karim, dated the instrument 1227, so that's almost 800 years old, and signed himself as servant of the king and sovereign. The craftsmanship again is remarkable, and includes some really beautiful, delicate Damascene silver inlay in the throne featured here on the right-hand side. But what is especially unique about this instrument uh, is the sophisticated calendar information depicted on the reverse. Here we see beautiful depictions of the 12 constellations or signs of the zodiac, seen here towards the outer part of the instrument on the left-hand side, uh, along with, towards the middle of the instrument, a depiction of the 28 constellations that make up the so-called lunar mansions, 
against which the monthly motions of the moon can be observed. Why all this information? It points to another practice associated with these instruments, that of astrology. Closely related to astronomy, or even entwined with it, astrology was at various times of great interest, particularly to those in power. A court astronomer would have been expected to be equally adept in the practice of astrology. And here we have another unique example of an astrolabe. We believe this instrument, which was made in 1221 uh, by Muhammad ibn Abu Bakr in Isfahan, may include the oldest complete working geared mechanism in the world. On the face of it, it looks like an ordinary astrolabe, if there is such a thing. But on the reverse, we see a unique feature. A small window at the top depicts the phase or age of the moon, and below there is a set of rings that display the relative movement of the moon and the sun about the earth, all coordinated by a set of carefully interlocking gears. The image on the right gives a sense of the geared mechanism that is hidden in the body of the instrument. And finally, uh, Last but not least, a fine series of instruments made in the 16th and 17th centuries by a family of makers here in Lahore, one of the greatest centers of instrument making of this time. This instrument was made by the head of the family by the name of Aladad in about 1570. Notice the different style of decoration, the very intricate florid style incorporating leaves and sometimes even birds on the riti. And it was a particular type of brass alloy developed in the foundries of Lahore that allowed for the hot metal working techniques that enabled such intricacies. Here we see a series of other instruments made by other members of that same family in Lahore. His great grandson, Muhammad Mukim, second from left, and the two grandsons, Kaim Muhammad, and another grandson, the two instruments to the right. I've mentioned briefly the importance of observatories across the Islamic world. Here we see a manuscript illustration of a famous Ottoman observatory in Istanbul. For those younger members of our audience, I wonder how many different types of scientific or mathematical instruments can you see in this picture and how many do you recognize? Clearly we see here not just the importance of scientific instruments and the business of measurement, but we also see an institution that was significant in bringing scholars together as a community, a place of conversation, debate, and exchange of ideas. And for those of you who've been looking for instruments, you may have spotted the globe in the foreground. This time, not a celestial or star globe, but if you look really carefully, a terrestrial globe, a globe of the Earth. The confidence to construct a terrestrial globe would, of course, have depended on having sufficient knowledge of geography. And this is another area of science in which Muslim scientists excelled, and of course, for very practical reasons. This rather beautiful map uh, of the world at the time was made by the Muslim scholar Al Idrisi, in 1154 for King Roger II of Sicily. It was one of the most advanced maps of its time. If you look very carefully, you may notice that I have presented this to you upside down, deliberately in order that you might be able to recognize the geography it depicts. At the time that this map was made, there was no universal convention of how a map should be presented in terms of its orientation. Today's accepted convention of north at the top and south at the bottom is more or less arbitrary. On the left, you can see Europe with Africa just below it. Uh, the center region of the map is recognizable as the Middle East. And towards the right, we have Asia. What would you expect to find at the center of such a map? 
Well, here it is. Uh, and uh, along the center line, we find, as you might expect, Mecca, the holy city towards which the faithful would pray. And so it is that in the museum's collection, we also have a, some very fine examples of that very practical instrument that incorporates geographical knowledge, the Kibler indicator. Essentially, it's an adaptation of the magnetic compass, but they invariably include simplified maps or tables of information about the locations of various cities, enabling the user to determine the Kibler, the direction of the holy city of Mecca. Here is a rather beautiful example of a Persian uh, instrument. It is constructed out of wood, but finely decorated with colored lacquers. It includes place names, a magnetic compass, and a sundial. Just take a look. I wonder if you can spot the various parts of the instrument. So here we see the compass. In fact, the compass needle itself is missing. Uh, here we see the cardinal points of the compass, north, east, south, and west. Here we see some place names, uh, the geographical knowledge or information that was incorporated into the instrument. Uh, here are some hour lines on a sundial because it also included a timekeeping instrument. And finally, the pin gnomon that is missing on this instrument that would have cast the shadow to tell the time from uh, originally. So one thing that I hope that you will have recognized from this brief survey um, of um, Islamic instruments from the early Islamic world is the combination of scholarship and practical knowledge and science linked with religious practice. Our expectations today are often that science and religion are somehow incompatible uh, or even contradictory. But this is clearly not the case in the scientific quest of the early Islamic world. Here, science is seen in service of religion. The two are in partnership. We can also imagine how all of this information about the stars was used for practical purposes of navigation, of course. Uh, and we've also mentioned that the use of these instruments to determine the positions of stars and planets was necessary for the practice of astrology, particularly in court circles. So just to finish off finally, uh, in summary, uh, Muslim scientists and mathematicians built on knowledge from ancient Greece. We know that Muslim scholars formed communities of scholarship in the big cities like Baghdad and Damascus and, uh, 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 and uh, uh, Cairo. Uh, and they built libraries and observatories as meeting places to share their understanding. And Muslim astronomers developed instruments like the astrolabe and the Kibla indicator that we've seen today from the museum's collection. Uh, and we've also seen how science in early Islam contributed to uh, religious practice. So I'm just going to finish there. Um, and thank you so much for listening. Um, if you want to find out more about any of these instruments that I've mentioned, uh, you can uh, take a look at the website, um, uh, which is hsm.ox.ac.uk, there on the slide. And you will find out more about our public programs and our projects as well, how we bring people together uh, and create a meeting point for science, art and belief. There will also be videos and animations uh, so, for example, if you want to find out more about how an astrolabe works uh, or an armillary sphere, do take a look at our website. I do have one more thing that I can share with you uh, now, um, and I will have a go at uh, uh, doing this. Um, uh, it is a short video. Uh, I'm hoping that the sound will come over OK, uh, and this video will perhaps uh, bring to life uh, the workings of the astrolabe, a uh, very complex instrument to understand. If you're unfamiliar with it, um, I can completely understand how uh, some of what I was talking about earlier 
uh, might have been uh, confusing. Let's have a go and see if we can share this uh, short uh, video. Uh, Dr. Chris, can you hear us? Yes. Uh, I don't think we're getting audio uh, for okay. the video. I'll try again. Yeah. Maybe you can switch the audio source to same as system on Zoom. Let's try this. Okay. Um, I'm unable to share at the moment. Oh, there we are. This is a fine example of one of the most dazzlingly ingenious types of instruments in the museum's collection, for which it is famous all over the world. It is called an astrolabe, and as the name suggests, it has everything to do with astronomy. The instrument is made of brass, which is partly why they have lasted so well over time, and they are beautifully and intricately crafted. In fact, one could say that they are as much artworks as they are scientific instruments. This one originates from the Islamic world. So what do they do? Well, if you look carefully, we can see that they are made up of a rotating disc, which is called the Riti in Latin, or al ankabut in Arabic, which means spider. It has been cut from a single sheet of metal and is in the form of a lattice that holds these delicate pointers which show the positions of individual stars. So the Riti as a whole is like a selective map of the stars in the heavens above which appear to rotate approximately once every 24 hours around what was thought to be the Earth at the centre of the universe. Beneath the Riti is the main body of the instrument, which consists of a number of plates which fit into a shallow dish called the mater. And engraved on these plates are patterns which look a little bit like a spider's web, representing a mathematical system of coordinates, a bit like the lines of latitude and longitude on a globe, but for the heavens instead. There is also another circle here on the Riti which indicates the position of the sun in the zodiac according to the time of year. And on the back of the instrument is a device for measuring the altitude or height of the sun or a star which then enables the user to set the position of the Riti on the front and calculate the positions of the stars and the time of day. So, the instrument as a whole is a bit like a celestial calculator, a calculator for the stars. 
So what has this got to do with Islam? Well, some of you may know that the Islamic calendar is based on the lunar calendar. And on the back of the instrument, we find the 12 lunar mansions corresponding to the lunar calendar marked on the scales around the outer edge. So the instrument could have been used to calculate the dates of religious festivals. And on the front of the instrument, we can also see some special timelines engraved onto the main body of the instrument, labelled in Arabic. I wonder if you can guess what these might be for. Maybe you know something about the practice of prayer uh, in Islam. Well, these lines represent the five times during the day that a Muslim is meant to pray according to their faith. So, as well as learning about astronomy, the instrument was also used in Islamic cultures for calculating the times of pray pray prayer during the day. Here we see a wonderful example of science, beauty and religion combined together. This particular instrument was given to the Mullah Idris Mosque in Fez, a city in Morocco. And on the back of the kursi, that's this bit here at the top, uh, it is inscribed, Praise to Allah alone, made by Muhammad B. Ahmed al-Batuti, year 1146. The year 1146 AH in the Islamic calendar is the same as the year 1733 in the Christian calendar, which makes this instrument nearly 300 years old. Who do you think might have used this instrument in the past? So, um, I could hear the video okay? The video was amazing. Thank you, Chris. Um, and so um, the talk has concluded. May we move on to the question answer sessions? Indeed. All right. So if anyone has any questions, if anyone has any questions, kindly raise your hand. We can translate to him. If you want to ask questions, so we can also do that. So any questions at all about the ancient Islamic instruments, about the celestial globe, astrolabs, and the amazing instruments that you showed us. Just kindly raise your hand and we'll bring over the mic to you. We have a question over there. Okay, first we'll take that question, then we'll take that. Uh, hello, Chris. Uh, I wanted to ask that uh, since you were explaining the uh, usage of gears and uh, these dials and stuff related to astronomy, so you think that all these technologies in the Islamic world were somehow derived from the Greek anti cathera mechanism? Thank you. That's thank, you. thank you for your question. Uh, yes. Um, well, clearly, uh, there is a precedent for the geared mechanism in the Antikythera mechanism. Um, uh, what, what, what is not clear is um, uh, we, we cannot trace whether this technology was derived directly from the ancient Greeks. There isn't the documentary evidence for that. Um, clearly, there's a lot of mathematical knowledge that was passed on from the ancient Greeks and was translated into Arabic, as we know, through that, those, that, that, that scholarly movement. Um, but um, yes, indeed, the Antikythera mechanism is a very, very complex uh, and seemingly isolated example um, of what essentially is an orrery, a planetarium, uh, a, a little bit different uh, to the working mechanism of a, a, an astrolabe. It doesn't depict the same thing, um, but it is an in, a, a very interesting example. Yes. Thank you for your question. All right, so we have another question. Uh, thank you, sir, for this wonderful talk. My question is, the instruments which you have introduced, are they available in Oxford Museum of Science and how they have been collected? Thank you. Yes, thank you for the question. Um, all the instruments that I've shared with you today uh, are um, on display at the History of Science Museum uh, in Oxford. 
uh, and are, are part of uh, um, a very unusual collection, as I said, of um, early instruments from the Islamic world. Uh, many of these were uh, donated as part of the founding collection of the museum by a man called Lewis Evans, uh, who was an active collector at the turn of the 19th and early 20th century. Um, he bought uh, many of his uh, instruments from uh, auctions or from individuals who owned these instruments. And just at this moment, we are doing a, a, a significant amount of research into the provenance of these instruments. How did they get, how did they arrive um, at the museum? And that's not an easy question to answer. We do not have, um, uh, we cannot trace that information uh, continuously uh, to the point of production in, in, in many cases, but we're, we're slowly piecing together more information there. All of these sorts of objects, these instruments, of course, would have been bought and sold, traded as functional scientific instruments. Thank you for that question. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you once again for a very wonderful talk. Uh, the most fascinating part of the talk, at least for me, was where you explained uh, a family of craftsmen, Mr. Aladad, who had a workshop in Lahore making these astrolobes. So how much do we know about this family? Uh, was he part of an ecosystem of instrument makers, scientists maybe? Uh, how long did this instrument making um, uh, venture lasted? Because we don't see Astrolab making uh, workshops here in Lahore today. Uh, and um, uh, just, just uh, general information about uh, what else was going on in Lahore at that time. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I, 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 I confess that this is not an area that I uh, of research that I'm an expert in. Um, the information that we have about the Lahore makers um, is rather restricted to the instruments that I've shared with you today, and that particularly fam that particular family of makers, the astrolabes, the um, uh, celestial globe that I shared with you. Um, what is particularly fascinating and what uh, and the research that has been done on these instruments is looking at the methods of production. Um, and this brings to light a really extraordinary knowledge of metall metallurgy uh, in the sense that the alloys that um, they made were a very distinctive type with different compositions of metals, mostly copper based, but also zinc and lead and other metals as well in different proportions, such that they were able to uh, uh, carry out the manufacturing processes that they did. Like I mentioned, for example, the lost wax uh, method of casting, uh, which would have required a particular property uh, of the, the, the metal flow. Um, and the astrolabes that were made, um, many of those were cut from sheet metal that required a particular crystalline property of the alloy as well. Um, that would allow for the intricacy of working too. So it's very clear that there was a lot of knowledge of metallurgy that was being shared across the region. Uh, the zinc itself probably came uh, from India, uh, uh, from sources there of you know, quite, quite high um, percentage uh, zinc, uh, rather than just zinc ore, zinc oxide, which um, was the case in many other production centers across the world, you know, like in, in Europe, for example. So there, would, there was definitely something very um, distinctive going on in, in Lahore and, and the region in terms of metallurgy as a whole. Uh, I can't, I'm afraid, answer the question about instrument making. We do know that this family was particularly prolific and there are other instruments in other collections around the world. Thank you for your question. Okay, so I think we're going to be taking the last question. First of all, I thank you for coming here today. Uh, my question is that uh, you give special sight towards the astrolabe. So no. the, uh, what do you think is very fascinating about the astrolabe? That, that's such a good question and a question that we're still trying to answer in many ways. Uh, in the conversations that we have at the museum, because uh, it is an instrument that fascinates so many people. One of the most common questions that we get from visitors to the museum 
and we do have one of the largest collections of astrolabes in the world, is how does an astrolabe work? I've tried to give you a sense of that today, but it's a very complex instrument, as I uh, sure you will appreciate, um, and it takes uh, years to really understand uh, the intricacies of this instrument and the sophistication of the mathematical knowledge that went into designing them. So I think um, one of the things about the astrolabe is that it's very difficult to identify a single purpose for it. We know that the astrolabe was made as a scholarly instrument, as an instrument for learning about astronomy and cosmology, an instrument of instruction, if you like. Um, but uh, it, 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 and, and we also know that it was used in other ways like astrology, for example, I mentioned today. And we know that powerful rulers were fascinated by this instrument because of the way in which it expressed something about the whole cosmos in one instrument. Uh, in some sense, it could be uh, an expression of a link with the divine, Allah's creation, the whole of the cosmos in one. So I think there are so many facets, so many aspects to the astrolabe that make it a fascinating instrument, um, uh, not for a single purpose, but for many both cultural and scientific. I hope that answers your question. Thank you for that question. Okay, actually we have one more question, the last one, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for this wonderful session over here. Uh, basically, I have just two questions. One of them, well, relates to the fact that I just want to confirm that if these astrolabes or the Ustorlab, as we locals may say, do they have anything to do with the working of the constellations apart from determining the exact location of the stars or the sun and the moon? And the second question that I just want to confirm is that, do you have any of the instruments formulated by Umar Khayyam over there in, in the British uh, Museum of Astronomy? Um, to the first question, I'm not sure if I entirely understood what you meant by your question about the constellations, but might I just say that, um, of course, it was only possible to depict on the astrolabe a selection uh, of prominent stars, uh, and from that to derive the main, the principal constellations, such as the constellations of the zodiac. Um, so, uh, you know, typically an astrolabe might carry uh, maybe maybe between 20 and 30 stars or something like that. Um, so uh, it, it is very selective in that sense. Uh, and of course, it considers the heavens to be a very simplified sphere, which is made up of these fixed stars uh, in, in, in positions which are almost constant in relation to each other. Um, so what we don't get is any kind of connection with our modern understanding of um, uh, astronomy, of astrophysics, of, um, uh, you know, galaxies or anything like that. You know, these are not concepts that were around at the time that these instruments were made. We're simply sort of depicting the positions of stars and from that deriving constellations which were known to the ancient Greeks and to other civilizations too. Um, as to your second question, I, uh, I'm afraid I'm unable to answer that question. We do not, as far as I know, have any instruments which are uh, linked with Omar Khayyam, um, but, um, uh, but, but, but clearly that, that, that is an interesting question, and that's uh, something I would like to pursue. Helen, can you cast any light Hello, on that yes, question? Yes, look, I've just <laughs> been looking on our collections database, which is accessible to the public, um, as well, so something you can take a look at when you go to our website. Um, and I'm afraid it doesn't look as though we do have um, any from that maker, I'm afraid. Thank you for your question. All right. And thank, thank, yeah. and th thank you to all of you for being such a fabulous audience. It's been a great pleasure for us to join you today. Um, thank you, Chris and Helen, and thank you, everyone. Thank you. Um, thank you, Helen, for also mentioning about the database at the History of Science Museum at or, you know, of University of Oxford's website. So I think all of you can check that out afterwards. 
So thank you once again, Helen and Chris. We really hope that we can also host you in person the next year or sometime even sooner. All right. So, yeah. all right. So we're going to be ending that meeting, and uh, our next session is a musical session. It's by Miss Bina Raza of the Sanjan Nagar Institute. She's going to be uh, giving a talk on music and education. And before that, we'll have a piano recital session by Zara Khan. My fellow host Janita is going to be further introducing them both. I would just request that we'll be beginning in the next. Two three minutes. We are going to start in minutes. So kindly, if you are sitting, please sit. And if you want to leave, then do you can also do that. So just give us two minutes. The next session will be beginning in two three minutes. So kindly, if you are sitting, 